Welcome to No Romance Without Finance. Today, our guest is Linda Babcock. Linda is a behavioral economist focused on understanding behaviors to women's advancement in the workplace and developing evidence-based interventions to promote a level playing field. She is the founder and director of the Program for Research and Outreach on Gender Equity in Society, which is called PROGRESS, which pursues positive and social change for women and girls through education, partnership, and research. Linda is the James M. Walton Professor in Economics at Carnegie Mellon University and the author of Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want, and Women Don't Ask, Negotiation and the Gender Divide. In this episode, Linda talks about the true root of the gender pay gap and how equitable distribution of labor can help us close it. She also talks about the double standard of acceptable workplace behaviors, like why men can be the boss, but women are bossy, and the proactive ways women can ensure their work is recognized and valued in the workplace. And most importantly, she talks about how to negotiate your salary like a pro. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the show. Hi, Fanny. I'm so happy to be here. I am so excited to have you on because you are an economist. And so you have street cred as to, to back up everything that I've been saying about the gender pay gap, to back up everything that I've been saying about um, women asking for more, more money, negotiating more salaries. And, you know, one thing that I really want to want to talk about is the gender pay gap, because I know that you've done a lot of research on that and you've actually written a book about it. Am I correct? I have a several books, one about negotiation, which you talked about, you know, how women need right. to negotiate for what they want. And my latest book, which came out last year, is called The No Club. And it's about how men and women spend their time at work. So we can get into all that, too. Oh, yeah, I would love that. Definitely. L- l- let's get into that. So we're, when we're talking about the gender pay gap. OK, some people say that, you know, this is not something that women should be really concerned with because it is the organiza- organizations that should be just paying women more that they should figure out, okay, who's getting paid what? And if a woman is paying, being paid less, they should pay her the equivalent of her male counterparts. And I don't know if I buy into that. So I kind of want your ideas around that because I think we women, yes, that ideally is the case, but since that's not the case now, we kind of need to take our destinies into our own hands and ask for the damn raise, ask for more money, make our make it known that we deserve more. So where do you land on that, Linda? Well, maybe I'll start at the beginning. And think, All right, let's start at the beginning. And, I love it. And think about what the wage gap really means, okay? Okay. When you think about the wage gap, there's really two pieces to it. And I call it apples to apples and apples to oranges. Okay. Okay. The apples to apples part is you take a man and a woman, they have the exactly the same job. What's the difference in their pay? That's one measure of the gap. And that part of the gap is actually pretty small. You know, we don't have a lot of unequal pay for equal work. And there's some, there's of course some, but that's not really Mm -hmm. where the discrepancies come in. It's that men and women are doing different kinds of work. And so they're being compensated differently. And this is actually a real problem because women's advancement is lagging behind men's advancement because they're given different duties that aren't the productive duties, the really big money duties, the really noticeable duties. And so that's what's causing them to lag behind is that they're not being allowed to do the work that will get them ahead to the next level. So that's really the bigger part of the gap. Interesting. Was that okay. men and women aren't at different levels because they're doing different kinds of things. Okay. So how do we fix that? What do we do about that? Well, that's actually what my latest book is about. It's about how okay. men and women spend their time at work. And what we find in our work is that managers are assigning women what we call non-promotable work. Okay. Okay. So let's think about what that is. It's things like helping other people with their work, getting people up to speed, training, sitting on different governance committees. You know, it's not the, the, what we call the promotable work, which are things like, you know, billable hours, things that are, that are central to the mission of the organization. Men are more given that work. And so when it comes to looking at promotions and raises, 
men appear to be more productive because they're given the work that allows them to be more productive. And so what we have to do is start changing the way we allocate work and make that even, and then women's wages will follow. And why do you think that's happening? Why do you think women are given those tax, uh, tasks that are not promotable? Well, it's kind of like a, a gender norm. So if you think about some of this work, like helping others, like who are you going to think of to help to assign someone to help others with their work? You think of a woman first. You know, these right. tend to be low status, um, you know, um, low power types of work. And so people, it, women come to mind more than men when thinking about assigning these duties. And so we have to stop doing that. And we have to think about mm -hmm. how can in our workplaces we assign this more equitably. And there's lots of ways to do that. This is not rocket science. We could fix this, fix this tomorrow if we wanted to. And how do we do that? Well, think about all the duties that are in, you know, a manager needs to take stock of, you know, what is the work that needs to be done and make sure that it's assigned equitably across men and women. So, you know, you can rank these tasks in terms of their promotability. How important is it to the organization? How visible is it? Does it use specialized skills that really let an employee shine? And, you know, think about that work in terms of how promotable it is. And make sure that if you have the non-promotable work that everybody has to do, take turns doing it. You know, if you have a task that no one wants to do, <laughs> draw a name out of a hat rather than just give it to a woman. Um, and so wow. really rethinking the way that work is assigned is what we're going to need to make the next set of progress on closing the gender wage gap. And how does a task become promotable and non-promotable? So I, I, I understand what, what you mean by that certain task, like help training others. But what, So what is the promotable task that, for example, a man is doing that will help him get promoted? Well, let's think about particular occupations. Maybe that's easiest, you know, to get okay. some really concrete examples. So let's say that you're a lawyer. What is promotable in a law firm? Time you spend hours. with billable hours, time you spend with billable clients. Hours. Okay. That's it. Pretty much everything else is yeah. non promotable, but there's right. a lot of that other stuff, right? You know, right. someone has to serve on the hiring committee, someone oh, has to I train see. the new people, someone has to, you know, help coworkers resolve conflicts. I see. I see. So I see. it's pretty easy once you take any given job to really distinguish mm -hmm. what the promotable part is and the non promotable part. We just aren't, our brains just aren't used to thinking that way. And we yes. really have to start um, orienting ourselves towards e distributing that work more equitably. Wow, that's a really, really interesting way of, of thinking about it, Linda, because I had never even thought about it that way. And, you know, when, 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 I, when I was running a team, we would have new people come in. And I had the, the men, you know, unfortunately, I'm in finance, most of the people on my team were men. Yeah, anyway, of course. Right? <laughs> but, but um, you know, I had the men train just as much as I had the women train. And I didn't even, I didn't even think about that. Yes, you know what, this is something that's taking away from them being able to produce more loans, which is the promotable task, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, Right. Versus them training this person, which is a non-promotable task. So I just think that that really just op opened my eyes to something that I'd never even thought about. And, you know, Patty, this happens in all kinds of occupations. You know, we talk to a bartender and the owner of the bar always gives her the duty to train the new bartenders. OK. And what happens right. when you train a bartender? You have to share your tips with them. You know, they're working right. alongside of you. You're sharing their tips. You're going to get paid less than the other bartender who is just serving drinks. So right. you really can think about it across all occupations. It's pretty easy to then identify what the promotable things are and what the non-promotable things are. Wow, that's that, that's really brilliant, Linda. Thank you for opening our eyes in, to that. And now that, that we have a, that concept in our minds, what do we do when we're given the non-promotable task? Yeah, that's a, it's great. It's a great question because women are asked to do more non-promotable mm -hmm. work than, than men. And right. women actually say yes more than, than men do. Women are expected to say yes, and there can be backlash against them when they say no. And so we're really forced into this no-win situation where we're asked to do these tasks, 
we feel pressure to say yes. And so we end up with these tasks. So you can, uh, this is where negotiation, it plays a really important role. And so if I'm asked to do a particular task, I can say, oh, that's great. You know, I'll do it this week, but why doesn't Sam do it next week? You know, you can kind of mm-hmm. put a time limit on it and so that you can right. rotate it or let's set up a rotation schedule. You know, if yep. someone needs to be training people, let's let's set up a weekly schedule or a monthly schedule and rotate that across all the employees. So that's the time to use your negotiation skills is to really make sure these tasks aren't yours forever. Right, right. Great, great ideas. Great ideas, Linda. This, this just opened my eyes. This is amazing. So I want to ask something else about the pay gap. And a lot of arguments have been centered around, it's not just uh, the, you know, promotable task versus the non-promotable task, but the pay gap is there because women just do different types of work that women like to do or apply to do, or, you know, like to do work that pays less. Is that accurate? Because you were saying, you know, for job for job, pound for pound, right? The the pay gap is really not that great. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not large if you're taking, you know, the same work for the same, um, the same occupation. Um, The pay gap isn't that large, but, but you're right. Women do go into different occupations, Um, but that could not be a choice. That could be anticipation to discrimination or lack of Mm -hmm. um, opportunity because you don't see people like you working in an organization like this. And so it is a, it is still a form of discrimination um, that women are not completely free as men to choose into different occupations. It sounds really outdated. Like Linda, I did wake up in the 1960s. No, no, Um, you're right. But it's still, it still happens today. You know, like, um, you see it on campus. I, I work at a, at a university. You see it on campus when you go into different classes. The gender mix in the different classes is, is mm-hmm. quite, quite stark. And there may be environments where women don't feel as comfortable um, as men. Now, is that a choice? It doesn't seem like that's a choice to me. It seems like that's a constraint that's placed on women sometimes that you know men don't have to face. And where do you think that comes from? Do you think that comes from a cultural inculcation from the time that we're children? Absolutely. You know, um, still, we think we've made so much progress on changing gender roles, and we have made some progress, um, but we're not where we need to be in terms of having equal opportunity. And, you know, people use that word a lot, and, and I think it's, you know, sometimes a little bit seen as passe, but equal opportunity is a really powerful concept. That's all women are really asking for, is to have a level playing field have the same opportunities and and the same constraints as, as men. So how do we fix it? I know that that's the million dollar question, right? If it's an inculcation from the time that we're children, what what can we do now as women? How do we fix that? Or how do we fix ourselves, really? Well, one of the things that we have to do is, is do push back against these norms. So I like to tell people, you know, anytime you get pushed back in a, on a gender norm to, to call it out. You know, um, we often have these norms against women being too assertive. You know, we've heard, you know, she's too ambitious. Um, exactly. <laughs> like, have you ever heard that from a man? Like, oh, this man is too ambitious. It, it just, you, Never. Wouldn't, you wouldn't say Never. that. Um, oh, no. He's such a go-getter. Exactly. That's what you hear. That's you know, so he's a positive. go-getter. That's positive, yeah. right? Right. right. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to take that moment to educate people and say, hey, you know, I'm glad she's ambitious. That's great. Women should be ambitious to really support each other, um, whether you're a man or a woman, to support women with ambition, to uh, support women who do negotiate, to support women who are assertive, to support women who want to have equal opportunity to promotable work so that they can advance at the same rate of, of, of men as men. So it's a, a lot about us uh, verbalizing the norms and correcting them. Right. And one of the biggest disappointing things that, that has occurred since I have started my TikTok channel is the comments that I get from women when, when, when I do a video about female bosses, I did a video about female bosses. And what I said is, I said that there's so many women out there that criticize, and men, criticize female bosses, 
saying that, you know, she's bossy, she's aggressive, she's a bitch. And I said that the only reason you're characterizing her as this, these, these adjectives is because she's a woman. If it, if it were a man exhibiting the same exact behavior, it would be, you know, he's a go-getter, you know, he, he knows what he wants, and it wouldn't be in the derogatory fashion that, you know, that, that you're saying it. And the reason that women, uh, the, the reason that you're saying this about women is because you don't expect women to act that way, right? So when you see the behavior of a man, the same exact behavior in a woman, it, you're taken aback and you're offended by it. And that automatically makes you think that it is a negative behavior. Am I correct in my, in my assessment of that? Patty, you are so right about this. That is, we okay. have a different standard. It's a double standard for what we think is acceptable behavior for men and what we think is acceptable behavior for women. But you just draw the line in a different place. And so right. the same thing that a man and a woman does, it can seem completely appropriate for a man to do and off the right. table and just, you know, not acceptable, you know, You've heard all the words that people use to describe women yeah. that they think are too assertive. And right. it's really for the same behavior that men are engaging in. And that's, again, when we need to step in and just start correcting the, the, the norm and say, you know, I think this is good. You know, she's doing this job well. She, this is how she needs to be in order to be effective here. And so exactly. that we start to have the language around changing norms, because that's the only way this it's is going to get solved. Absolutely. And we women need to stop putting each other down in the workplace. Ladies, listen to me. You need to stop doing that because this is where it all starts. It, you know, the second that you open your mouth and start saying, you know, yes, she's too aggressive. She's too bitchy. She's that she's this, the worst bosses I've ever had are women. I mean, I can't tell you how many comments I get about that. The second that you start doing that is the second that you are losing your own power. You are shooting yourself in the foot. You're preventing yourself from getting that promotion. You're, pre you're preventing yourself from getting that raise because you know, when, when one woman loses, we all lose. And, you know, Linda, I, I remember th this story when I was, uh, when I was working at another organization, there was a woman there that she, she was, she was tough, but she was fair. She was really tough. And the men that worked under her, and, you know, I'm in finance again, male dominated industry, right? The men that worked under her were just these aggressive alpha males, right? Super aggressive alpha males. And all they did was talk about, you know, what a bitch she was, how mean she was, how this and that. And, you know, when I asked about specific behaviors as to, well, what does she do that she's a bitch? Well, she doesn't take shit from us, essentially. You know I mean? <laughs> she essentially. told me what to do. Like, yes, she's your boss. that was yeah. the response. Yeah. <laughs> she told, she, t she tells me what to do, you know, like, and, and I was like, you know what? Well, I realized right, right there and then, and I said it to them. I'm like, if she weren't like that, you guys would eat her alive. You wouldn't respect These, her. Yeah, absolutely. These alpha males would have eaten her alive. The second that she, she would have just let down her guard a little bit. These guys would have been all over her. And I've experienced that because, you know, when I was a manager, a lot, a lot of my direct reports were men and yeah. They, they pushed the boundaries. They, I mean, they went to, to, to the point where, you know, I had to check them and be like, I am your boss. I don't know who you think you're talking to, but I am your boss. So, and then a man doesn't have to ever say that because they don't push the boundaries like that. So that has to, that, that comes from me. I had to say that because you're pushing my boundaries and they're like, well, he never said, you know, he's my boss. Cause you've never pushed him to that point. Right. You've always respected him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of thing that we're up against in this fight for equal opportunity. And it, it is a fight because those kinds of norms and expectations around men and women, uh, you know, they change really slowly. And so yep. we need to press where we can um, you know, and, and, and try to make those changes if we really want to level the playing field for women. And do you see the leveling of the playing field in your research and the things that you do? I mean, do, do you see things changing? 
Yeah, of course. You know, um, I wrote a book called uh, Women Don't Ask 20 some years ago. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, at that time, there were large gender gaps in who negotiated, you know, with men mm -hmm. negotiating four times as often as women, for example, over their pay. Um, but in the last few years, we've seen a narrowing of that gap. And some studies are even showing that young women today are negotiating as much as men. So I do see these things changing and I see that as a really positive sign. For me, the next frontier is this issue of how we spend our time at work, which really you don't hear people talking about. Um, okay. And what you do at work is and how you spend your time between your various duties is the major factor in how you're going to be evaluated. And so we really have to take a close look at this. You know, women, you know, can work with their managers, but there are some things that women can do on their own, which is, you know, to the extent that you have some autonomy in your workplace about how you spend your time to really think carefully about how to prioritize that time. Um, and we have a chapter in our book that lays out some exercises that really helps you to figure out what's the promotable work? How can you prioritize your time? What are some of the strategies you can use and so we can start to do ourselves that work ourselves at the same time that we try to change our organizations in really how they're assigning this work. And can you give us just a, just a few of them of think, things that women can do to take back their time? Yeah, you know, one of, one of the easiest exercises to do is just to keep a calendar for a week and write down all the things that you do, how much time you spend doing each kind of big category of thing. And then go through and rank it and say, you know, is this really important for my performance evaluation? Or is nobody ever going to notice I did this and it was a total waste of my time? You know, mm -hmm. and sort of look at how you're spending your time. And then try to make some systematic changes the next week and say, I think I'm going to work a little more time on these tasks that are more critical to my advancement. And I'm going to try to maybe do a B plus job on these other ones. You know, not everything has right. to be an A plus. So, right, right. or can I find a way to rotate this off to someone, you know? And, and so you begin to reprioritize and remanage your schedule in a way that gets you to focus on really what the most important things are for your advancement. Great. That, that's great. And do you think that some of, the, some of the fact that we, we really don't advance is because we don't brag about ourselves enough? Like I think, I, I think a lot of the, t be, and you were saying it, and this kind of goes in hand in hand, in hand about, about, you know, the tasks that we accomplish. But what I notice in the workplace is the second a man does something right, oh my gosh, he is bragging to everybody, including me, you know, I'm his boss. Look at all these wonderful things I've done. And the woman just as accomplished, just kicking ass to doesn't, you know, doesn't really brag. And I've noticed that. And do you think that's the reason that we're not getting promoted? Well, it certainly is a is an issue, and you know, there's a good reason for it. It's it's not that that women aren't aren't you know thinking about well, maybe I should take some credit here. But again, it comes back to these norms. There tends to be a lot of pushback when a woman advertises her accomplishments. Is she seen mm -hmm. as you know as yep. as pushy or you boastful? Know, yeah, exactly. She's a braggart. Um, and so, you know, this is another thing where we have to change norms around. But also, this is something we can do to support each other. We can mm -hmm. we can call out something that someone else did, you know, or, um, you know, if you're in a meeting and, and uh, you know, you can say, oh, you know, Patty, that was so great that you did this. Like, that was really, yes. really nice. Why don't you share that with the group? Right. And so you can kind of plan these things stealthily ahead of time with each other yes. to make sure that your accomplishments are known because something isn't promotable unless it's visible. If no one knows you did it, exactly. it's not going to matter. Right. Um, and so those are things that we need to get some, some shed some light on, uh, you know, for others to see. Exactly. And I, I think it's, it's kind of like a vicious, vicious cycle to where, you know, we, we do something right and we don't brag about it. It doesn't get noticed. We don't get promoted and then we feel frustrated as to why we're not getting promoted. We get upset and it's just, you know, it's a vicious cycle. 
and you have you have to make your accomplishments known and make the accomplishments of the other women known just as you were saying yeah. have each other's backs totally because we need to have each other's backs we need to call out when someone is disrespectful toward another woman i i remember i was in a, i was in a meeting and again mostly men it was me and another woman and men love to take credit for somebody else's ideas so, you know, a, the other woman had said something and it was a, it was a great idea. I thought it was wonderful. And then this other guy says it and he, and when he says it, everyone starts clapping. I mean, this happens to me all the time. Like, <laughs> oh, what a great idea, Stan, where Linda had just said it, you know, five minutes ago. Yeah. And like, you know, Linda didn't speak up and I always speak up in those instances, but I was like, oh, Stan, yeah, that's great that you said what Linda just said five minutes ago. Exactly. You know? And it's, it's interesting. It's something that the women in the Obama white house had a specific strategy about doing that is. Oh, when, they did. Yeah. They actually, you know, uh, explicitly, you know, decided when something like that happened and Stan took credit for Linda's ideas that you Patty would step in and say, Hey, Stan, that's so great that you like Linda's ideas. And so it really oh, started to amazing. change the norms around and the and the viewpoints of, of, of seeing women as important. And as a result, President Obama started, you know, calling on women more and asking for their ideas because it became clear that they were a real source of of of, of, of knowledge in the group. And it was really this explicit strategy that the women had to make sure that women's ideas were recognized as theirs and not stolen by others. That is fantastic. And I want every woman listening out there to please implement the strategies in your workplace because it starts with us. It's not going to start with the men. It starts well, with us. I mean, maybe, but you know, we do have a lot of allies out there. You know, we do have a lot of men who want women to have equal opportunity, who You're right. see it as, You're right. as I'm, well. I'm a little jaded. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a little jaded too, but, but there are a lot of men out there that can help and we can't forget about them yeah. because no, they, you're right. they often have more power in workplaces than we do. And, yeah. and so, you know, it, it, it's, it, I've seen lots of instances where men are happy to help women once they know what to do. You know, I think we often right. exclude men from these conversations. And as a result, men are sort of feeling like, well, there's this wage gap, but I don't know what my role in it is. Like, what, right. is, what am I supposed to do differently? And sometimes just pointing out ways that they can be helpful in this quest. Um, they'll Correct. happily try to enact those strategies and, and help us do that. Yes. And, you know, to be, to be fair, I had a very, very good boss and I will name him because he's amazing. Um, Dan Weinstein was my boss when I was in private equity and again, very male dominated industry, but he always surrounded himself with women. Mm -hmm. His partner was a woman. And, and let me tell you, this is the kind of guy he is, is that he owned the majority of the business, you know, over 80% of the business as uh, she owned a small share of the business, but he would always refer to her as his partner. He would never ever talk about how much she, you know he has versus she has. Yeah. He would always, anytime that there was a decision to be made, he would say, you know what, let me check with her, even though he had the decision-making power, right? And he hired me, a woman, and he always really understood the power of women. Mm -hmm. And that, and to have a man like that really propelled my career into being able to do different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're right. You know, there are, there are plenty of men out there that, that want to help women and they just have to know what to do. I think he was lucky enough to where, you know, his father yeah. was really yeah. a Renaissance man and he, he had a really good role model. And he, I think that really played a role in him, but yeah, this is, this is by, 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 by no means trying to put all men down because there, there are men out there that want to help. Yeah, no, that's right. And you can think about three types, you know, the ones that will never get it and don't want to. That's a group I right. don't have any time for. <laughs> there's the group that already get it and are we already helping, and that's great. And then there's the, a very, very large group of men who want to help but don't know what to do. And if we can sure. focus our attention on those and change the behavior yes. of those men, we can make huge progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how do we focus on, on those, Linda, on those men? What, what can we do as women to help them see it? Well, I think, you know, this work that I've been doing around this non-promotable and, and promotable work is, is, a, is a good example of it. Um, you know, I have this colleague at work and kind of how I got started on this, uh, this, uh, this topic 
is that we have the same job. He actually sits across the hall from me. And I just saw him going about his day very differently. So I'm a university professor and my promotable job is research. That's what I get rewarded for. And I would see him in his office and he'd be hunkered down just doing research all day. And I'd be running around going to meetings, you know, doing, <laughs> doing administrative work, helping others, you know, work. Non-promotable work. I was doing all the non-promotable work. And, you know, we sort of, you know, I went over to his office one day and I was like, let me look at your calendar. You know, I want to see what you're spending your time on. And I showed him mine and we kind of laughed about it. And um, he was like, um, yeah, that's, you know, I've, I've noticed this too. You know, you're doing all this different kind of work. You know, why is this? And, you know, I said, look, people ask me to do this work. And, you know, and he said, yeah, if they asked me to do it, I'd say no. And we kind of laughed about that. And then, you know, we had a really honest discussion about he, he, him starting to realize, wow, when I say no, that probably means someone's going to ask you, Linda, and you're going to be forced to do this. And it was kind of like wow. a light bulb going off for him. And he really started thinking about what his, how his behavior was affecting his female colleagues around him and started doing things differently by agreeing to do some of these things and taking on some of this work. And so he just Great. hadn't thought about it. It just wasn't in his language. You know, we didn't. Yes. And so he, he, the last thing he wanted to be doing is hurting his female colleagues. Mm -hmm. And he didn't really realize how he had inadvertently been doing that. And so right. little conversations like that can make a big difference, I think. That is phenomenal. That is a phenomenal way of doing it. And yes, you're right. And, you know, at the end of the day, everything comes down to open and honest conversations and not, not being afraid or intimidated to talk about how we feel and, and what we're thinking, even, even in the workplace. And I think once you're able to be vulnerable and not afraid of having those conversations, so many great things open up, including someone being like, yeah, you know what? You are doing all the other crappy work yeah, exactly. that, that maybe I could, I could help you with. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, I was pretty high, high up in the organization. So I felt I had some ability to have that conversation. And maybe other women who are lower um, in the organization or maybe aren't as privileged as I am to have those right. conversations, it may be harder. And so we, women and men at more senior levels with more ability to have these frank conversations need to be really doing that to look after our 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 younger colleagues and you absolutely know, frankly mentoring younger colleagues about this issue you know every time i go yeah. to talk to a group i talk to the junior people and say look <laughs> you got to really pay attention to how you spend your time and and you really mm -hmm. need to manage this and um, your workflow in the right way in order to get ahead well, that, that's going to be part of the conversations I'm going to be having with every woman, really. Oh, good. Go, going, really going forward, because that, that was is just so eye-opening for me. Um, so one last thing I want to ask you, because I know that every, every, every woman wants to know the best way to negotiate their salary. What is the best strategy for a woman to negotiate her salary? How do, how do we ask for a raise? Yeah, it's... Not rocket science. It's actually pretty straightforward. And, okay. you know, there's a lot of great negotiation books out there. I can, I can recommend a few, but think about it in terms of just a few basic steps. Okay. Okay. The first is to think about what you want. All right. Now it, it may not actually be salary. If you want to be earning more money, you certainly could say, well, I'll negotiate about salary, but actually a better way to potentially to earn more is to focus on this promotable work and have the conversation about with your boss about how you spend your time. How can I do the things that help me advance in this organization? How should I be spending my time? And that can lead to better opportunity in the future, in the long run. In the short run though, to negotiate your salary, you wanna do your homework first, all right? You wanna find out what is the market for people like me with the skills that I have. And that can be anything from doing a theoretical job search, you know, going on different websites, finding out what jobs you could get and what you could be earning to sort of calibrate where your salary should be. You know, the other way to do some research is internally to try to find out where you fit in the pecking order of the salary schedule at your organization. And mm -hmm. organizations have different norms about this. You know, some organizations are going to these, you know, very public, salary matrices where you know what everybody else earns and then it's easy to know if you know you're underpaid relative to your colleagues right. um, but if you don't have such a transparent salary schedule 
you can ask people what it is you think you should be earning. You know, it's often um, dicey to ask someone what they earn. You know, so if I said, right, you tell me what you earn, that puts you in a very uncomfortable position. Absolutely. But I might say, hey, Patty, you know, you know, my job, what is it you think I should be earning? You know, mm-hmm. what, what's the what's the what's yes. the right wage rate for me? And, Smarter way to ask the question. And that's a really good way to get calibrated. And that's really the first big step to know, you know, what's a reasonable amount to be asking for because mm-hmm. you don't want to make either mistake, which is asking for too much or asking for too little. You know, you right. want to go in with an appropriate request that is reasonable giving your position and the rest of the salary schedule um, in your right. organization. And so to then make that request, but you also have to remember it's an exchange, you know, that um, your employee will likely want something for that. And you need to be prepared to think about what that's going to be. You know, how is it that you can contribute more to the organization? What can I be doing differently? How is it that I can get this salary? What is it I need to do? What metrics do you see I need to reach? And so Mm -hmm. to have that as a conversation rather than, here's what I'm asking for. It's yes or no. It's, I want to be at a certain level. How is it we can get me there? What are the things I need to do? So it's it's more of a dialogue rather than a, you know, a, a you're not haggling, (laughs) right? You have a a conversation. Yeah. And, and I always say, you know, because I, I, I talk about how to ask for a raise and I always say, you want to go in with facts and not feelings. Yeah. And yeah. I say, you know, I say, if you want to ask for a raise, start, start out with figuring out, you know, go to payscale.com, salary.com, figure out what percentile you land it for your salary, for someone with your level of experience in, in the marketplace. So let's yeah. say you land in the 50th percentile. Right. And then I say, when you go in, make, make, an appointment to meet with your boss, but also have a list of accomplishments that you've done. The promotable skills. I'm going to start yeah. using that, that okay. term, right? right? Good. Yeah. The promotable skills, right? The list of accomplishments and, and how that's contributed to the organization. Like if you work for a pro- on a project that increased the sales of the organization by 10%, you talk about that. Exactly. And then, you know, you, you say, Hey, because a lot of people go in and be like, well, Joe makes more than me. So I I want to make the same. Yeah. It's like, that's a horrible reason to ask for a raise, you know? So, you know, you, you go in with, with data, you know, I, these are my accomplishments. My salary is down the 50th percentile based on my accomplishments. I'm really above average, right? 50th percentile is average. So I'm asking for X, which is in the 75th percentile. Mm -hmm. And I always say, if they say no, then as you, to your point, then you say, okay, what do I need to do? in order to earn the 75th percentile, yeah. write it down, go do those things, yeah. document that you've done those things and, have a plan. and then you can come back. Right. Yeah. Have a plan. Exactly. Yeah, yeah plan. that's right. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, okay. Think about it as, you know, this conversation that we're, we're in this together, you know, right. you want me to be successful. You want me to be productive. How can we maximize my productivity at work and having that conversation that this, that, that, time about how you're spending your time and what are the things that you could be doing that would show more value, you know, right. You really want to think about this as what are the really special skills that you have that you bring to the organization that are valuable and make sure you're spending time using those skills rather than using the skills that anyone could do who who maybe doesn't have those skills because that's not the best use of your time, you know? So yes. really thinking about where is my value added and how can I really focus on those activities that make the most of that value added? Because that's your biggest competitive advantage, right? Absolutely. Something, something that somebody else doesn't have. You're right. I never even thought, thought about it that way is that um, what can you do that not everybody can do right. and leverage that? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's great. That is great. Linda, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You have really, I'm telling you, by the information that you provided to us, you really helped a lot of women out there today just try to reach financial independence, level up in their careers, level up in their jobs, not being afraid to ask for a raise, how to do it, and really started thinking about what tasks are they doing on a daily basis? I'm even thinking about all the <laughs> shit that I'm doing every day. That's not a promotable task. My God, are you kidding? Yeah. So 
Oh my That's gosh. So I, yeah, you really taught me a lot. So really thank you for joining the podcast and um, to the listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. Please make sure to uh, subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast. That's the way that we keep it going. And until ne next time, never forget that a man is not a financial plan. Linda, thank you again. That was a pleasure. Thanks, Patty.